Dwight Hiscano. Thank you for coming. Uh, I've been taking photographs for seriously since 1986. Um, first picked up a camera, a little Kodak Instamatic uh, that my dad gave me uh, back in the 70s. Um, and I took, uh, I was an environmental studies major at school and uh, getting lots of C's and D's, although I enjoyed it and I've, I've always been passionate about the environment. And then I took an art course and I got an A. Uh, and then I took a photography course and I got another A. And then I thought, okay, I got to talk to my parents <laughs> and talk them into allowing me to do something creative and not something uh, more traditional than you. So I changed my major late uh, to a photography major and an environmental studies minor. So you were able to now you, now you can photograph the environment. Exactly. Okay. So, okay. so it still all, comes into play. And I'm still there. very passionate about it. Um, I've always been a visual person um, when I was a kid. Uh, there's an old home movie of my sister and I uh, leaving the house on Christmas mor or uh, Easter morning with our little Easter baskets. Um, my sister went out first. She's very focused and very driven, which I admire. And I, I don't have those. Uh, I don't have that personality, but I, I admire those traits in, in my sister. Um, but so she walks out the front door. She's probably eight or nine years old um, and just goes straight, straight ahead, you know, right for the car, right for mommy, daddy. You were, you know, had the movie camera going. And I came out after her. And I'm probably two and a half, three years old, something like that, probably around three years old. And my eyes are in the sky and I'm, I'm just doing this and I'm taking my time and I'm looking everywhere, in every direction. So I, I looked at that, I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. I, I guess I've always been visual. And I remember as a child on our summer vacations, I would always notice, notice things like, you know, birds off in the distance or whatever, and um, before other people notice. Okay. Um, and then later on, uh, in let's see, I guess I'm four years old, uh, this is, I experienced the first of three Fairly serious eye accidents, um, and I, I don't—I almost lost this eye on three different occasions. The first uh, was uh, being on the wrong end of a baseball bat. My brother was practicing his swing, told me to get out of the way, and little four-year-old me playing with my little airplane <laughs> ignored my brother, which I often did. I often had to do, <laughs> uh, and then boom, I got whacked. Uh, bad black eye right above my eye, but my eye survived. Flash forward to fourth grade, I got hit under weird circumstances by a jagged piece of board right under my eye and I had 24 stitches. If it was a quarter inches, a quarter inch or so north of where it hit, uh, I would have lost my eye. And then in eighth grade, messing around with a bottle rocket uh, with a friend, being irresponsible as eighth graders are, launching through, I have a cardboard tube, I got the bottle rocket hanging over the edge or so I thought, and instead of hanging over the edge, it was resting on the fuse. The fuse burned down, went through the tube, hit the ground, came up, got me right in the eye. So I spent a week uh, in the hospital with both eyes patched because your eyes work together. And if, you, if one's moving, then it'll strain the other one, it'll strain the injured one. Um, so laying on my back in a hospital bed, essentially blind for a week, other, other than the doctor coming in once a day to check on it. Um, it was an amazing experience. It was one of the best experiences of my life and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Uh, every other sense takes over. Your sense of touch, your sense of smell, your sense of hearing, obviously. Uh, by three or four days into it, I could tell which nurses were walking down the hallway by their footsteps, which is really cool. Uh, so I don't feel sorry for blind people anymore. They, they have a yeah. huge, very rich universe that they're living in that we can't even uh, imagine. Um, and we're missing out on what they're experiencing to an extent. Anyway, when I came out of that, I think I kind of saw things differently. Um, and I began to get more and more into visual arts and drawing and painting and sculpture and, you know, all the different things that I um, experimented with in high school and then later on in college. Uh, so flash forward, I worked for a newspaper for a year, few years after college, uh, was laid off in 86, no, 89. Uh, and I've been on my own ever since. I've been shooting 
um, freelance. I do a lot. I do portraits. I do events. I shoot pictures of dogs, uh, which I'll show you a few of. Um, but my passion is shooting the landscape, um, and it always has been. And I've sold thousands of prints through galleries and through art, uh, art dealers and uh, mostly corporate spaces like hospitals and office buildings. Um, but a lot of people buy them to hang in their living rooms also. Uh, so that's where I come from. That's um, that's my my main goal. And this is the final product. Um, this is whoops, ancient. I got my dad's easel that he used to use painting. It's ancient, but I love it. <laughs> so anyway, this is Terrace Pond. If you can see, hopefully there aren't many reflections. This is in the New Jersey Highlands. Uh, I'm standing on that ledge shooting down on a pond at sunset, the island that looks like it's floating um, in the middle there. And what makes this photo and some of the things that I lose sleep over, some of the issues I have with composition um, pertain to, to minor details or what might seem minor to most people. In this case, it's the reflection of this tree. The tree's right here, it's casting that reflection. I only got two exposures of this. Uh, this is a film with a medium format camera. Um, only got two exposures of this before the sunset started to fade and the, the clouds were moving pretty quickly. But it's this background, this little highlight here in the clouds that made this photo successful. Um, the next exposure that I took, and I took a few horizontals also, but the next vertical I took, these clouds had moved and that uh, pine tree there was not nearly as pronounced. So it's little details like that. I'm going to talk about that during the slideshow. Um, that will make or break a, a successful photograph. Uh, and that's something we all need to keep in mind. A lot of people will shoot uh, and not be mindful of what's going on in the periphery, on the, on the uh, outsides of the frame. So you'll see distracting elements in a lot of people's photographs, uh, branches or uh, cell towers or whatever, leaves. Um, elements that will draw you out of the photograph. I look at a photograph as a journey for the eye. Like your eye is invited into this, and then it kind of does a little dance around the composition, around the image. Um, and if there are any distractions that are pulling you away from what you want the viewer to experience, then, then I, I think that will degrade the photo. I, I think that will make it less successful. Um, How big was that island? That's probably 20 or 30 feet. Uh, maybe 90, I'd say probably about 20 feet. It's pretty small. Um, it's a beautiful place, Terrace Pond. If you ever get a chance to hike up there, it's just this incredible pond. It's got these rocky cliffs around it, and it's all pudding stone, which you'll see in the northern part of the highlands, that purple rock with a little face of quartz and stuff. Really beautiful spot. Um, so, photography is art, to photographers at least. <laughs> um, what's the number one rule when you're creating a piece of art? Don't be shy. Well, I, I don't know about the art part, but some of the photography, I worry about the exposure. <laughs> of course. Um, and there are a lot of things to keep in mind when you're yeah. trying to create a photograph. But when talking about art, when talking about a painting or a sculpture or a piece of photograph, number one rule. Composition. Composition is very important. There are no rules. It's a trick question. If Picasso followed the rules, we wouldn't know who Picasso was. So one of my goals when I'm out shooting is to try to break the rules. And you'll see that I have a lot of even horizons and you know uh, symmetrical reflections and stuff like that. I've been told you're not supposed to do that. Well, I kind of like it. I think it looks cool, so I do it anyway. Uh, you're not supposed to center an object. Um, I, I often center objects. My nose is centered. My wife's face is symmetrical. The universe is probably symmetrical and balanced. Um, so why not, you know, a piece of artwork? Why not? Why can't that be symmetrical and perfectly balanced? Uh, a tree is perfectly balanced. Uh, an atom is perfectly balanced. So there's no reason not to have that. And I'm, I'm not sure where that came from, you know, who decided that that should be a rule, but it's, uh, rules are to be tossed out as far as I'm concerned. Obviously, when you're first starting out, um, the rule of thirds, I think that's useful. Uh, but again, don't be afraid to ignore what the 
college professors might tell you or what the critics or the, the people who write articles in photography magazines might say. It's your photography, your, your photography, your artwork is your own. And in order to make it your own, you, you, you're going to have to stray from what you've been taught. Uh, don't be afraid to be inspired. And I was talking to Tom here earlier about that. Um, it's great to be inspired. And I was, when I first started out, would look at Ansel Adams, you know, would worship Ansel Adams and the other photographers of the West and be inspired. And, and I would go out and try to imitate what they did. And then I found myself kind of thinking, oh, well, no, wait a second, I'm seeing something different here. So I'm going to go beyond what they might have done and maybe change direction a little bit and make it my own. So that's one, one of my goals. And I think you know, most successful photographers are, are those that, and, and artists are those whose work breaks some boundaries. Um, I'm going to zip through these. I, I'm, Afraid we don't have enough time to really discuss everything. Very good. Mm -hmm. Delaware River. This conference is about rivers. It's about water. It's about the uh, northwestern New Jersey. So I had to include a few photos. This isn't a spectacular photo. There's not a whole lot going on in it. Um, it's pretty. It's a river. How can you go wrong? Uh, how can you go wrong? But I felt I should include it among one of the first slides. Um, I can't even remember where this is. I think this is down by. Uh, Bulls Island. I'd have to check my files. Um, we talked about art. I studied Asian art in school. I studied art history. And I find that some of the art that I love the most is reflected in some of my images. Um, so there's almost a minimalist approach to some Asian work, uh, which I love that. There's a certain purity to that. Um, so a lot of my images might seem simplistic and have uh, be less busy. But it all depends on my mood, obviously. Uh, the Hudson River School. This is Worthington Whitridge, Whitridge, I believe. Um, uh, New Jersey artist who was uh, somewhat famous during the uh, Hudson River School during that time, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, I guess it was more late 1800s. Is that mm -hmm. right? Um, so I love this stuff. And when I'm in a museum, I will plant myself in front of some of these uh, paintings and just be in awe and take it in. Uh, and I often feel like I could walk into the painting and just kind of, I want to walk into it and explore that landscape. Um, now, the reason I'm including this, I have another one here. Um, this is uh, my shot of the Black River and you can sit, see some similarities there. And this isn't conscious. So I think this is just kind of on a subconscious level. Um, I had another one, I think I removed it. Um, but with these painters, every element within the frame is equally important. So when he's painting these twigs up here, the curvature in the branches, the leaves on either side, um, the reflections, the bird dead center, even this little branch right here and the curves and the vines here, they all add up to a successful image. They're all consciously put there. Um, and, and maybe not, I, I shouldn't say consciously, I think this is from the heart. But when they're painting, it's what feels right to them. And, and uh, you know, obviously they have more control than we do as photographers. Um, but you'll see some of these elements uh, in some of my photos. And again, I just kind of pointing the camera around, looking at the viewfinder until it feels right. I'm not necessarily as conscious, you know, I'm not saying, okay, I'm going to put that branch there. I'm going to put that rock down there. It just kind of turns out that way. Um, so while I'm panning and, and exploring through the lens, uh, I'll end up with something like this, and then I'll realize later, oh, there is a curve here. And it works kind of with this diagonal here, and it balances out a curve here. And that might, uh, might balance out the, a dark area down below or an angle in the rock. So, uh, and you'll notice that the lines in this rock and the angle here are kind of reflective or, or right. kind of parallel, the, the branches here. So they all work together and they balance. And as I said before, your eye is experiencing a journey. Your eye is kind of traveling through that photo and dancing around. And it's kept with it's kept in the frame. If I had something, this annoys me a little bit, <laughs> but if I have something really heavy on, on the periphery that's not helping to frame the photo, then the viewer's eye might stray from you know where I, where I want that, where I want the eyes to be. Jackson Pollock. 
either love her, you love him or you hate him, um, you're not a fan. Oh, it, you know, yeah, I do love him. Oh, you do? Okay, good. good. Well, that's good to hear. You know, a lot of people just uh, shake their head as soon as, they, <laughs> as soon as they show this slide. They just see a mess. Um, I see a universe here full of stars. I see a flux of birds. I see, this might sound weird, I, love, I see leaves blowing in the wind. That's the feeling I get from a Jackson Pollock. And each of these splatters, he was very conscious of that. He would do a little dance around his canvas and, and place things exactly where he wanted them. It's not as random and haphazard as some people might think. Um, so I, I love this stuff. I, I was in front of one at uh, the Museum of Modern Art a few years ago. And huge, I think this thing was 30 feet long. And it was incredible just to be there in front of this just dazzling display of whites and blacks and, and colors. Um, I, I just, I really love this stuff. Uh, anyway, so it's reflected in some of my, my photos. This is just stains. I decided to include this. Uh, salt stains on the sidewalk. Uh, yeah, well, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, thanks. Um, all right, thanks. Um, so yeah, salt, salt stains on the sidewalk. I just shot this with my iPhone. Just like a little bit down. Yeah, I think we have. Um, so lots of stuff going on. It's very busy, but I again looking through the phone. I took my time and I actually waited until I got certain stuff. I'm sorry. It, it sort of found your your frame. In, it, exactly. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of fun, and I and I love the little heart. Um, this same principles apply here. Uh, very busy photograph, uh, but again, I'm, I'm uh, making sure that the eye doesn't stray. Again, you're doing a dance in here, and I like the stick here, and that stick down there, and this curve here. Um, so it all just leaves just everything, even this little uh, horse tail, whatever that is. Um, so and there's structure and there's complementary colors. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, which is good. It's not just lights and darks. It is colors that, that work with each other. Now, this looks a little saturated. I think that's just the way the projector is interpreting, interpreting it. I don't enhance my work. I don't crank up the saturation slider. I don't clone out cell towers or anything like that. That to me, and some of you might disagree with this, but uh, it seems dishonest. Uh, and a lot of people I see on Instagram, I'll see a photo of a landscape in New England. New England colors don't need any help. But that <laughs> photographer cranked the saturation all the way up and it just gets ugly and it's not being truthful unless you're admitting to it. So, now, this is kind of weird. Um, these are LED lights on the Delaware River. So it's sort of, it's almost appropriate in this case. Um, uh, this is something I noticed while I was shooting a job for Camden County, I was doing a job for the park system. Uh, and I had finished, the sun was going down. I'm right on the banks uh, where near the aquarium uh, and near the, the New Jersey, near the battleship New Jersey, walking along and all of a sudden the bridge, the Benjamin Franklin Bridge starts to light up with these little LED lights. This is about 12 years ago, I think. So LEDs were a new thing at that point. And I just noticed the point, the tiny points of light dancing on the waves in the river. And I thought, okay, I've never seen this before. I've seen the moon do it. Right. And I've seen other lights do it, but nothing with that, with this precision. Um, and this was during a dark moment in my life. I had lost some loved ones, you know, just a few years before this. So I was kind of depressed and down. And I discovered this and I, I possessed. So I went down probably three, four, five times. I can't remember. At least four times. Um, at one point, I'm on the Camden waterfront uh, at you know between twelve midnight and one in the morning, uh, <laughs> <laughs> taking pictures in the dark. Um, probably not the safest thing to do. No. Uh, but I got some interesting images out of it, and uh, um, I really love this stuff. But again, back to Jackson Pollock. That's kind of similar uh, yeah. principles are going on. Here's another one. What's cool is that there's a certain depth to it because the waves are rising. And so some of the little light points of light dancing around the tops of the wave. Uh, in the background, you have blurrier points of light in, in uh, 
in the troughs and in, in between the waves. So it almost looks like there's a, kind of a depth to it. Fast shutter speed or slow shutter speed? Um, somewhere in between. I think these were probably, I'd have to go look, but probably eight of a second or faster. Mm -hmm. So not, not too slow. Because um, I'm, I'm trying to capture what I often do, um, like when I, what I used to do when I was first, first starting out, I would shoot blurry waterfalls so they look like milk. Yeah. Uh, and now that I, I'm, I'm, my goal is to get something closer to what the human eye sees. So when I'm shooting a waterfall, I'm not, it's not going to be that blurry, white, milky, or at least not as much. It's going to have a little more texture. To to it. It. Yes. And, and what the eye sees and what the camera sees are still going to be different. Um, but I'm trying to get closer to what was in front of me at the time and try to be more truthful in that. Uh, Mark Rothko, love his work, very meditative, very soothing for me to look at. I, it, it feels almost dreamlike. Uh, and I'm reminded of sunsets uh, and sunrises. This is uh, Cedar Mesa, Bears Ears, now Bears Ears National Monument. Uh, fleeting moment where the rim of a canyon was lit up against the stormy background. Um, literally a minute or so, uh, and I zipped off a bunch of exposures. This is back with the film. Uh, I had another ancient photo. This is a sunrise. It looks a little bright. Uh, it's not that washed out. Um, sunrise down in Long Beach Island, May 1989, if I'm not mistaken, on Kodachrome 64. Mm -hmm. Uh, and finally, Franz Klein, uh, the abstract expressionist. I love this stuff. I look at an image like this and I, it feels like I'm a punch in the chest almost. It, it's so powerful to me and so striking and so bold um, and just using these minimal elements. So I have a series here that I took looking straight up through a rusty tin roof down in Sandy Hook. Um, so this is just the remnants of this roof that's been uh, rotting and, and rusting over the past 120 years or so. Uh, and I saw it, it's on a cloudy day, and I thought, wow, this is cool. It's, these are pure compositional elements and, and nothing more. And it's a great way to train my eye and my, my uh, approach to composition. Um, and once I think a person can master that, and make a pleasing composition with as few elements as possible, you can apply that to uh, a landscape. And instead of looking at something as striking as this, I, I like this one because it almost looks like a human finger here. But you'll look at that and you'll start to notice this, uh, patches of color and lights and darks. One uh, little trick that I used to do, I don't do quite as much. No, this I just included because it looked kind of cool. Uh, it's a puddle, bubbles on an icy puddle. Um, but again, just pure composition. One trick that I have done in the past is to throw the camera out of focus and look at it with uh, just a, a blurry image looking, looking at uh, through your viewfinder and reduce everything to just patches of color and patches of black and white. And that helps you compose. Um, my eye that I told you about uh, is blurry. It was 2030, the last time I got tested, and that was 30 years ago. Um, I don't think it's too much wor worse now, but it is still, it's blurry. Um, so I often use that to compose uh, when I reduce the scene um, to, to blurry objects. It's easy to see what's going to be more pronounced in the final image. Uh, this is down in Point Pleasant. Okay, I'm down in Point Pleasant. What was that? This is a detail of... Uh, the patterns in the sand after the oh, wave sand, of heat. Okay. Yeah, what sand? Um, nice. Yeah, thank you. I, I really Very like nice this one. I see a lot of pictures of the river deltas in Iceland, mm -hmm. and this reminded me of that. I haven't had a chance to get to Iceland yet, so I went to Point Pleasant. So. Um, now, we're talking about imitating the great photographers. I do tend to imitate Ansel Adams a little bit at times. I love shooting black and white, and I'm doing a lot more of it these days. This was one of his uh, spots. Actually, this is uh, Zabriskie Point, um, Gower Gulch in Death Valley. Um, now in black and white, it's a different approach entirely. I think uh, I give myself a little more leeway. I'm, I'm here, I'm, I'm burning and dodging and lightning and darkening 
different elements within the photo a lot more than I would do in color. With a color image, I hardly touch because I think it's implied that a color image is what I saw when I shot it. Black and white, we don't see in black and white. I feel it's like I regard it as an entirely different uh, medium, entirely different. So I will adjust the contrast. I will adjust the lights and darks. I will go in. I remember I spent about five hours on this thing. Mm -hmm. And I was going to bring the print. The print looks a lot nicer than this. Um, I can't remember where else I work on, worked on. I'll have to look at it. I think I did something up here. I darkened this a little bit. But just to make some of these ridge lines a little more pronounced. And then I, was it done or digital? This is digital. Do you use a histogram when you're doing that? Or? Um, no, no way. Well, sometimes I'll refer to it. Just so I'm not, I don't like completely blown out whites. Uh, if you look at the, the print and the original on a computer screen, this is going to be a bit darker. You can see more detail in here. It's just the projector's not. But yeah, this is digital. Uh, I did do a lot of black and white when I was first starting out with film, but um, this makes it easier. And it's also digital photography, I think. I'm not quite sure what goes into producing the inks and the papers, um, but more environmentally friendly. This I used to print on Cibachrome, and there's some nasty chemicals in <laughs> that does roll your eyes. Well, uh, plus it's a very contrast image to begin with. Yes. So right. you lose all the, you know, the separation in the, in the lower tones. Right, definitely. Uh, but the chemicals that get poured down the drain, and, and shooting black and white, I did feel guilty. You know, and I would try to recycle it as much as possible. But, you know, some nasty stuff was getting thrown down the drain, poured down the drain back in those days. And uh, hopefully, I, my ink comes from Japan, from Epson. Hopefully, they're trying to reuse it and not pouring it all down the drain. Um, okay, Black River. I'm going to zip through these because I don't think, oh boy, okay. It's nice that I picked up the ambient light. Put Thank it in you. The water. Yeah, uh, and this looks a little saturated just because of the projector. It shouldn't be that saturated. But again, some of those elements I referred to earlier. And this is too blown out. It shouldn't look like that. Um, and this is not an alligator. When kids, <laughs> when kids see that, they think it's an alligator. Uh, but again, some of those elements from the Hudson River School paintings are coming into play here. Here I, I used a polarizing filter. I don't use one anymore unless I'm on this assignment. Um, I don't have anything against them. I just personally, I was abusing them back in the day. This was uh, Wrangell St. Elias National Park in Alaska. Um, I should speak about conservation. I haven't really talked about that quite yet. Um, this is our la largest national park and no one's heard of it. It's the size of Switzerland. Combined with the area around it, the preserved lands around it, in both in Canada and in Alaska, it's an area the size of Poland. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible landscape. I think there are more 14,000 foot mountains within this uh, land that within this national park than any other national park. Oh, I can't remember. They're just a long list of superlatives. Wildlife. So is it south of Anchorage? Glaciers. Uh, no, this is Wrangell St. Elias. I think it's southeast of Anchorage. I'd have to look at a map. I so it's in it's in the U.S. Yeah. Okay. Incredible place. Absolutely incredible. Um, anyway, back to the, the polarizing filter. I did use that. I didn't abuse it in this situation, but it does help us see, see the, the rocks under the reflection. It cancels out the reflection and cuts glare, and it makes the colors a little, it makes them pop a little more. Well, this is an, it's an interesting photo. Though. Thank you, yes. Um, well, I love it. I still like it. But if I were to go back, you wouldn't see those rocks quite as, quite as clearly. Uh, this is Banff National Park. Taylor Lake, um, beautiful spot, backpacked up there. Again, here I'm playing with a reflection that's you know, symmetrical and I like it. This is in the New Jersey Highlands. Um, this is when I first discovered symmetry, when I first really stumbled on it. I hadn't been seriously shooting with a medium format. I think I'd only had the camera for a year or so. But there's a lot going on in here. I, I walked out into the swamp with waders on and I was still shooting black and white at the time. And I had color film with me. And I dropped, there were these beautiful clouds rushing by. It was after a hurricane. Um, I guess it was a tropical storm by that point. This was back in 1986, I think, uh, or 87. 
Um, I dropped the back of my camera, the film back, in the water. I had to reach in and grab it and dry it off. And while I'm struggling with that, these beautiful gray clouds are going by. And I'm like, damn, I'm missing it. And, uh, and I was trying to decide, once I dried it off, should I shoot black and white or should I shoot color? I stuck a roll of color in there, print film, negative film. And the clouds were gone by the time I got the shot. And while I'm shooting, water is pouring into my waders. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was awful. And I was really upset. I walked back to my Jeep and, and uh, just sloshing around in my boots. It was gross. Beaches swimming around. And, stuff. and I was disappointed because I thought I missed the shot. And then I looked, I got a contact sheet, a proof sheet back from the lab. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. It's symmetrical. It's perfectly balanced. One of my favorite places, the New Jersey Highlands. And you have life and death. It's dead stump here. And you got these two little uh, ceilings poking out of there. And you have man's intervention because the, stump, the stump's been chopped off. Um, so there's a lot going on in here. I just thought, okay, this is kind of an interesting photo. And from that point on, I think I've been more drawn to symmetry and, and balance. Um, it's, it's just it's an old, I've only made a few prints of that, um, but it's an old favorite. This is a shock terrace pond that I showed you. This one, kind of similar principles as I'm using the terrace pond thing, a sunset, reflection of sunset. This is actually that same swamp, different you know, years later. This is in the 90s. But wandering around with my camera, I didn't get many photos that day. The sun went down, and I'm just looking down at these lily pads, and I see just a very subtle hints of the sunset behind it. Um, and this won an award, highly honored, as they say, nature's best. And it was on display at the Smithsonian. So that's mm -hmm. that was right. fun to, to go down there and see it, my work on the wall in the Smithsonian among a bunch of probably 100 or so other really beautiful photos. Um, if you ever have a chance, uh, I, I know they used to print a magazine. I, I hope they still do, but it's incredible. Nature's best. Um, if not, uh, definitely go online and take a look. And they have a couple of contests to be made. This is my Ansel Adams ripoff, <laughs> uh, but mine has birds. There you go. So, uh, right. thanks. This is um, Delaware Water Gap, Mount Tammany. This is the Indian head. You can see his nose and lips and eye. It almost looks like Chief Tammany is dreaming. And uh, the moon was coming up. I knew it was. And I went out there for that reason. And I took a few shots. I had to wait until it got a little darker, a little closer to sunset. And I had this nice golden light. This is Kodachrome 64. So the colors aren't quite as pronounced, unfortunately. But it's fairly accurate. They were subdued. But anyway, I'm composed. I'm getting this shot. I got my camera on the tripod. This is. Uh, 645 camera, uh, and then these two turkey vultures flew at it, you know, and I saw them through the viewfinder, and I clicked, and I got one shot of it, uh, and I think that they really had a, a, an additional, you know, a nice dimension. Yeah. For it. Uh, Partition Arch, it's Arches National Park. Uh, what I like about this, check my time here, I'm sorry, okay, um, and it's almost like two photographs in one, which is kind of fun. And Arches National Park is a beautiful place. If you ever have a chance, if you haven't been, you should definitely go check it out. This is in the Bahamas. There's a long story to this, but Al McPherson was shooting, doing a shoot on the beach, and Liz Fair, who was a very fairly famous singer, uh, was also on the beach. And they were in matching bathing suits. They don't know each other. They were in different parts of the beach. And it was so funny because a friend of mine said, oh, I, I went to a Liz Fair concert. She was talking about that island you went to in the Bahamas. And she said she was there and Al McPherson was doing a photo shoot and they're both wearing the same color bathing suit. And it was really funny. I, I was like, I was there. I was there that day. <laughs> very, very funny, interesting experience. And, uh, um, anyway, I wandered off. I got away from this a little bit of a crowd surrounding Al and watching the, the photo shoot. I avoided that. Walked down the beach, and as the sun was getting lower and the afternoon progressed, I noticed low tide, these beautiful little ripples in the water. And I, I shot a bunch. I got two that I'm happy with. But the one that makes this is you know, just a curve in the ripples here, balanced out by the clouds. And just a very soothing photo, for me at least, and uh, one of my favorite places. Oh, this is the same place. It was pouring rain. 
but it's one of those sun showers. And so we had a thunderstorm down there. And I thought, okay, we're definitely going to get a rainbow. I just knew it. And I quickly packed up my camera, uh, put it in a plastic bag, and ran down to the bay. And of course, as soon as everything cleared, I got this interesting rainbow that seems to be shutting out of the cloud here. It's nice. yeah, thank you. Um, these are shot on film. Uh, this one's digital. Another instance where uh, we shouldn't be afraid of the weather. Um, again, pouring rain that day, but I saw little pockets of blue peeking through, and I knew that, and you could see the sun off in the distance kind of hitting little bits in you know, parts of the water. So I knew sooner or later, the sand down here is pink, like Bermuda, and the water, of course, is the tropical water. Um, but I knew sooner or later the sun would come out and zap my, my scene, so I just had to wait for a while and get wet. But finally, this, this happened. It was and I, worth it, though. It was worth it, yeah. Pink sand, same place. Here again, reducing the elements just to like pure compositional form, you know, pure compositional elements. Here, black and white, uh, using the same principle. This is on Block Island. And I got a whole series of these. I really haven't done much with There's another one. And Block Island again. And again, never be afraid of the weather when you're going out and shooting, because uh, you might get something interesting and dramatic. Yeah, all these seem a little washed out. I wish I could adjust the uh, the projector. They look nice over here on the screen. More black and white snow scene. Uh, this is the Saic River between New Jersey Audubon's Sherman Hoffman Preserve and Jockey Hollow. And this is South Mountain Reservation. This is South Mountain Reservation again. So if I were to shoot this 20 years ago, this would just be really white, like bright, milky, you know. And then I'd, I'd shy away from that now. There's a little bit more texture now. But again, the camera's not going to replicate. Even if you freeze the photo and all the little droplets are frozen in midair, the, eye, the human eye doesn't see that either. So photography is a compromise. It always has been. Your lenses are either going to give you tunnel vision or peripheral vision that it's, you know, and then distort the image. With a, you know, that's when you're using a, a wide-angle lens. So nothing is going to replicate exactly what the human eye sees. This is South Mountain Reservation again. Beautiful place, Essex County, 10, 15 minutes from Newark, and it's this 2,000 acre, just incredible, beautiful landscape. And Teddy Roosevelt used to hunt there. This is up in the Catskills, another waterfall. This is in the White Mountains. And I've tried to include water in as many of these as possible. This is uh, a preserve piece of land in Hunterdon County, the Hunterdon Land Trust preserved this. Incredible place. Uh, I'm trying to think of uh, the name of the preserve, but it's right, right on the Delaware River, right close to the Delaware River, and it's a, a farm farmland that's um, kind of overgrown now. And then it has this ravine with this, this beautiful stream running through it. Uh, so but is there a polarizing filter on this? No, I did not use a polarizing filter. This is pretty much just what. If you, you know, think so, but it could still be into the water. Yeah, well, sometimes the reflections aren't this yeah. you know, strong. It depends on what, what light is hitting it, what light is getting down to the bottom of the water and illuminating right. the rocks. Right. But I like this. I haven't printed it's a this. gorgeous photo. Thank you. I have a color version of it that I have printed. Um, but I like the black and white better. Um, but anyway, how do you land trust? Definitely check out their website and see some of what they've preserved. But it's, it's, they've done some really, really incredible work, and some of the areas that they preserve are really, really breathtaking and beautiful. Uh, this is the Passaic River between Chatham and Summit, near where I live. Not only am I obsessed with water and the ocean, but I'm obsessed with trees. Uh, I can go nuts with trees. Uh, uh, I have gone nuts with trees. Uh, this is an old growth sycamore in Essex County. So my trees. I'm sorry? It's so high key. Yeah, this is an old growth white oak in my hometown of Summit in uh, Union County. It's also high key, but there's really a lot of detail in the snow and the separation between the snow on the, bra on the branches and the sky in the background. Definitely. And that's like yes. a very delicate balance there. It's difficult, and it's something I've been struggling with. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But yeah, in order to get that separation from a white sky and white snow 
and also not to go out of gamut, not to like, I'm not pushing the histogram all the way to the right. Yeah, all the branches are still, they're not blown out. I mean, you know, the light isn't wrapped around the branches so much that they disappear. Exactly, it's thank you, yes. Like right there. And if you look at the, the original, each of these twigs is visible. That's amazing. And that's what I struggle with. And it takes a long time to get that right, you know, using contrast, using different filters in the, in the, on the computer. This is digital. That's extraordinary. Um, thank you, it should be a little darker. Yeah, just like the lights, you know, like in the room, I think it probably would show. Right, right. Okay, so now we were talking about the iPhone. Can anyone tell me what this is? Inside of my retina. <laughs> That's a good one. Yes, a lot of people say they look like nerves or uh, capillaries or whatever. We were talking about the iPhone earlier. It's um, some, some kind of a push with reflection. No, it's not even a reflection. It's a tree. It's a tree taken with a drone. Yeah. After a snowstorm. That's a prank. Well, I've never been up there, so I couldn't. That's really <laughs> so if you can see it, you can see how blown out the projector. This is this is more accurate. That's nice. Um, thank you. So this is this is my new thing, and what I've been obsessing over for the last couple of years. We talked about the iPhone and the, the quality and how much it's improving, and with that. More and more people are invited to be photographers or claim to be photographers. And so it's hard for someone like me, who's been shooting for 30 years, to do different things, to do things that you can't do with a phone. I had the idea for this before I bought a drone. I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to shoot through an old growth tree, like one of the ones I just saw, like we just saw, uh, from above, shooting through the branches using snow as a backdrop. And, I would, and then I forgot about it. I bought the drone. I'm out playing around with it. I'm actually on a job with it. And it got windy. And it's a snowy, you know, very snowy scene. And I had to quickly bring it down. But as I'm bringing it down, I saw a tree from directly above. There's a tree right next to me. And I, and I saw it. And I'm like, oh, right. I wanted to do that. And I for, I'd forgotten all about it. So I snapped a few photos. I went back that night to look at them. And I was really, really taken by, by this. And then from that point on, I was just like the LED lights before. I've been possessed that's, with this. That's, that's, um, I have about 100 or so now that. Um, they have to find a tree that's all by itself. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's snow with no rocks around it. Exactly. Um, this was after a blizzard. And in, not too much snow on the tree. Yeah, yeah but the, some, sometimes I might have one here. Uh, when there's a little snow on the tree, that actually adds another element to it, which yeah. is nice. Uh, but then separating that snow from from uh, the background, it's, it's as Donna said, it's very difficult. So I've, I've spent hours on these things. I have about 100 or so, hoping to get a book published, uh, or maybe a magazine article, something like that. Um, but so this is my new obsession. Yeah, well, that's definitely a winner. Thank you very much. Um, they've won a few awards. Um, I've gotten honorable mentions in the, the Siena Awards. Um, there are a couple other that I can well, draw it'll, win, it'll win a couple more awards. Thank you. Right? Yes. Um, and what I'm noticing is every tree is different. Every tree has its own character. Uh, and we recognize these as trees. You can see it. It looks familiar. It's like, okay, that looks yeah. a tree, but it's something's out of context here. So this is what birds see. This is not what we see. So it's something new and different, and it's something that I've been developing over the last two years since that blizzard back in 2021. And again, I'm, I'm just obsessed. So I'm, I'm hoping to get maybe an exhibit or something. And I'm going to keep shooting. I'm, I pray for snow now. <laughs> OK, here's another tree. I've sold a few of these. Again, too blown out. I'm sorry about that. This is on a golf course, actually, uh, but an old growth oak. And it's one of those days where the snow was going sideways and everything had a white outline yeah. to it. And I had driven by this tree countless times and I always thought I got to get back and shoot this tree someday and finally that that day arrived I looked out my window and I could see all the snow was going sideways ran out there and got that so here's something different this is a tree that's illuminated by uh, traffic lights and street lights this is in Bloomfield I had done a job I do a lot of work for St. Barnabas for the RWJ Barnabas uh, hospital system I had done a job for them right around sunset in the wintertime. And as I'm walking back to my car, there's a couple feet of snow on the ground. There's a lot of snow and it all been shoveled to the side of the road. But I'm walking back and I just, I saw this. I'm like, okay, I got my camera with me. Why not make this work? 
fortunately, I was wearing these almost loafer-like shoes because it was a, a I had to dress up for the event, and so I had to walk through a snow <laughs> a snow bag up to my knees, and I froze. I was freezing. All I had was a coat. I, was, I think I was wearing a tie, but uh, I was able to get a couple yeah, shots of this. Thank you. Um, there's another one. So these beautiful old growth sycamores. What's interesting in New Jersey, the closer you get to the city, the more old growth you see, and the more the second growth trees look mature and huge. I was talking about South Mountain Reservation before. If you walk through there, it's like walking through an old growth forest because it hasn't been logged since the 1800s probably. So the tulips, they're, they're the biggest, uh, but there are lots of oak trees and beech trees in there. Um, so it's interesting how New Jersey has these, these old growth trees everywhere. Are these and with uh, multiple cars? This, it was a traffic light turning red, yellow, green, uh, and then there was a street lamp. Was it, was it kind of a closure or was it like? They were, uh, uh, it was dark, it was my older camera, so I had to shoot, I'm shooting at 100, maybe even 50, because I want as much detail as possible. So yes, they were long exposures. You can see some stars and planets in the, in the original. That's why the sky is blue, because you're able to get more um, yes, plus there's a lot of light pollution. Light, yeah. uh, but you can see stars and stuff, they don't streak, so it's probably uh, 15, 20 seconds. Oh, wow. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Reeves Reed Arboretum, beautiful place in my hometown. That's a dogwood. Uh, this South Mountain Reservation again. So, in addition to trees, I find myself in urban areas every now and then. Um, this is Oh, I can't remember the name of the park. This is in New York, uptown. Ah, I can't remember. So here I'm using trees to shoot some architecture. Here I'm using trees in a reflection. This is in Newark. And it's almost three photos in one. So just kind of interesting composition. But again, I, I look at, I, I'm drawn to shapes. To shapes, yes, to, to minimalist, uh, to, to scenes that are, are just forms that I can use compositionally. And reduce to a certain uh, to get a certain minimalistic effect. Price uh, of building. This is a downtown financial district. Uh, every now and then, I'll find a scene and want to put a human in it. Um, here, I was shooting for uh, Horizon Blue Cross, the insurance company. Um, they needed they wanted to decorate their office with scenes from around the neighborhood. Um, so I got a few shots from, uh, you know, just Newark, you know, buildings and that sort of thing. And then before I wrapped up, I saw this, which kind of a nice geometry to it. It almost looks like Santa Fe to me, kind of reminded me of that. I'm, I'm really obsessed with Adobe's, you know, with all the architecture out there. Um, so I thought, okay, this is kind of cool. Maybe if I wait for the right person to walk by. And someone came by, I got a shot with someone over here. I got a shot with a woman in a stroller over there. But this guy did it with his yellow shirt, the shadow, that square behind him. Yeah. That's what made the photo for me out of, out of maybe nine or ten exposures. That's the, this, the one that wins. It's just the placement was right. Uh, this is uh, Battery Park area, I think. I, don't know. Um, I just I love the streak of blue there. Uh, flowers. I'm drawn to flowers like every photographer. So I have a few close-up shots here. Um, these are Reeves Reed Arboretum. Again, beautiful place. Here I used a driveway. Uh, it's almost like I was shooting in the studio with a gray uh, muslin or a gray, gray seamless paper behind it. And I, I saw this. Zinnia? No. What's it called? I can't remember what it's called. Anyway, saw the flower. And what I do, and what I think every photographer should do is, and I teach this in my workshops, um, when you find the subject, move around it. Look at it from every single angle. Uh, look at it from straight up above. Look at it, you can climb under it and look underneath. You know, look at it from underneath. So here I saw this, and I noticed if I just kind of moved a little bit, it had this pure gray background to it. And uh, it, it really uh, focuses your attention on the flower itself. Here's another one. So this is kind of a green cast, but this should be pure gray. And again, it should be a little dark. And flowers in black and white are pretty too. Now, the one thing I struggle with this compositionally, is just a little too much blank space here, a little too much negative space. 
and that annoys me. And that's the sort of thing that I lose sleep over. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go in and clone that flower and move it over. I can't do that. And I, there weren't any other flowers. I could. There's nothing more I could do with it. It was a real struggle. If I moved slightly, something would have protruded here. And so it's a nice image. I like it. I've never sold it, but I like it. Um, people never remark that they like it, but just a little too heavy on the lower right there. I liked it that way, though, because it gives... It emphasizes the, the the direction of the the, 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 pattern, the, the yeah. flow, right? And without that, all of it, I think it what wouldn't I, have as much dynamic. I just want a little less of it. That's all I want. But if I cropped in, then I'd be losing this. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I understand okay. what you. Yeah, right. I, I believe me. I've tried everything with this thing. I do believe you. Um, but I appreciate that, and, and and I do. I agree with that. Um, but it's just it's just a little too heavy for me, and it's something it's it's kind of weird. But I feel it when I look at artwork, I feel it in my chest. And I know that sounds odd, but it, it, if it doesn't look right, then I, I I have this sinking feeling, just really subtle, and I can feel it right now looking at that, just like oh, it's not quite perfect. And did you ever look at it upside down? Yes, I believe me. I've toyed with it all different ways. The irony is that the more you do photography, the more you understand, the more you you can do, and the more that bothers you when you don't do exactly. it. Exactly. Like a double edged sword. Exactly. And you're a photographer also, and a very good one. And and I think you know exactly what. what yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> it's we want to make it perfect. We want every art piece of artwork to be perfect. So. And, and as we get better and as we progress, we become more you know, perfectionist. And, and we're, we're the most critical of each other's work. And the are. first thing the photographer does when they look at somebody else's photograph is like they're like crossing. Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I do that often. I'm like, oh, that could have been better. Right. And, I, and I find myself doing that with very famous photographers and think <laughs> this is National Geographic. That shouldn't be there. Yeah. Uh, and I know that's arrogant of me to do that, but I'm just that's that's how I react. Right. That's how I feel. Are we running out of time? No. no, no, no. Okay, good. Okay. I mentioned dogs earlier. Um, and one of my goals, again, trying to keep my head above the flood of uh, new photographers uh, and people who call them themselves photographers just because they have a phone in their pocket. I had someone come in, I, I owned a gallery for five years in Marstown. I had someone come in and they saw that snowy oak tree. Uh, I had that front and center above the fireplace in, this, in the main room. And this woman said, oh, my brother-in-law just took a picture just like that on his iPhone. And I just kind of, I felt like saying, no, he didn't. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't, I just had to say, oh, really, that's really cool, good. And maybe it was beautiful, maybe it was incredible. Chances are, he didn't put as much into that image as I would, or as any of you would. And he probably didn't see as much in yours either, as a, you know. Probably, yeah. Yeah, that's the other side of it. Anyway, so I'm trying to do things that a person with a phone can't do. And it's very difficult to shoot a portrait of a dog. I've always loved animals, I've always loved dogs. Um, I used to do a lot of work for St. Hubert's, it's a big animal shelter in uh, Morris County, in Madison. Um, so this is a, a new outlet for me uh, to be creative and to have fun. Um, so I've been doing a lot of dog portraits. I have a few of them that I've put in here. That was, I can't remember her name, darn it. Pitbull, beautiful dog, really wonderful dog, actually. This is Pebbles. <laughs> this one won an award. It was in um, Black and White magazine, one of, one of my favorite magazines. And it, it, uh, they have a monthly, um, what do they call it, the Single Image Spotlight Award. Um, and I won this a couple of years ago. Um, so what makes this, obviously, is the drool. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I was never drawn to bulldogs. I was never a big fan. I'm not even sure if they should, should be breeding dogs like this. Uh, but Pebbles came in. Um, I think this was an auction item. I donated it. So the person who won the auction, it's usually for a conservation group or charity, um, he comes in with this Pebbles, and it was a wonderful dog and really smart, constantly looking up at, at uh, I can't remember the guy's name, uh, his owner, uh, her owner, just like, am I doing it right, Dad? And he's like, okay, sit over there. And Pebbles like sit and looks up and just a really wonderful dog to work with. And now I love bulldogs, and whenever I see them, I have to say hello. So, um, but anyway, this is something you can't do with a phone.
This is Fletcher. This is my Lulu, who's no longer with us, howling. She was a blue tick coonhound. Here she is again. Beautiful dog. Um, we lost her in 2020 because 2020 sucked. <laughs> Excuse my language. Um, there were other losses, obviously. Um, this is uh, Kipling, little dachshund. And this is my current dog, Rue. She's a short haired border collie. Difficult to photograph, doesn't like to stay in one place, uh, but I managed to get a couple shots. Um, this is the New Jersey Highlands. Okay, I have some more landscapes for you and some more water scenes. This is a nature conservancy preserve. Uh, the mountain behind there um, is Kittatinny Ridge. Um, I can't remember the name of the preserve, uh, but the Nature Conservancy has done amazing work throughout the state. Um, I was, used to be on their board. I uh, used to do a lot of volunteer work for them, taking pictures of these preserves. And I traveled all over the state. Um, and they're all just incredible. Just the, the, some of the, the landscapes that they've preserved. Um, really, really beautiful. And we talked about tourism, and that's one of the themes of this conference. Places like this are a draw, and I would see other people out there enjoying them, which is nice, bird watchers and, and hikers and that sort of thing. This is part of their Bobcat Alley. So they're trying to um, establish a system of preserves between Kittatinny Ridge, you know, where the Delaware Water Gap is, and the Highlands, where we are now. Um, and they're buying up bits and pieces of, uh, you know, farms and woods and whatever else they can find uh, to establish a corridor for Bobcats to move back and forth. Um, really cool project, and they're they're always they always have something they're working on, um, and they're always looking twenty years ahead. Um, they preserved a beautiful piece of land down the Pine Barrens recently. I think it was around five thousand acres. Um, they've preserved tons of land down at Cape May along the uh, Delaware Bay shores, just like the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, New Jersey Audubon, just buying up bits and pieces whenever they can, and. Um, there are not as many available parcels left, um, but they they have their eyes on some, and they will continue to do good work. Um, but preserving these lands uh, does do a great deal. Just uh, as our Secretary of State was saying, it, it does stimulate the economy. Sure. Uh, when you're down in Cape May, you're going to see, depending on time of year, tons of other people down there just to just to watch the birds. To watch the uh, the shorebird migration in the spring and the hawk migration in the fall, they wouldn't be doing that at that land if those lands weren't preserved. So you know the importance of preservation can't be stressed enough. Uh, this is in the Highlands. Also in the Highlands, this is uh, Round Valley Reservoir. Uh, also in the Highlands, I have a number of Highlands shots here. Um, these last couple, I'm not sure about Round Valley, but I know this one and this one. Uh, both are along the headwaters of the Delaware River, uh, which is why I included that. And this is Merrill Creek Reservoir, which is also um, feeds the, Del the Delaware River. Mm -hmm. This is uh, along the Appalachian Trail. Beautiful spot, um, not far from the Delaware Water Gap. This is farther north up in Stokes, I believe. Uh, this is Hunted and Land Trust land again. Uh, Delaware River, uh, looking towards the water gap, not far from here. Um, this is Buttermilk Falls in March, actually. I was struck by all the green uh, pines and rhododendrons behind it. Almost, almost suggests summer, or spring. Yeah. Um, but it was rigid. This I is, see. yeah, this is early March, um, and it, I just remember it being a very cold day. Uh, this is Stokes again. This is Delaware again. I showed you that earlier. Um, this is Van Camp and Brook. This is that one of those long exposures I talked about earlier where the water is unrealistically white and milky looking. And now I'm annoyed by it. Uh, I still like the photo. Um, this was the cover. Of, I did a New Jersey book about 20 years ago, a coffee table book. And it was a vertical version of this that was the cover. Um, beautiful spot, Van Campen, Van Campen Brook, Van Campen Glen. Um, it's not too far from the Delaware Water Gap. It feeds the Delaware. 
Uh, again, just incredible area, almost looks tropical. Like no, it's, it was pretty dark down in there. It was a hemlock forest. Deep canyon that they. Yeah, on. Deep with trees on both sides. Exactly, yeah. Sunshine's there probably 10 minutes a day. Exactly. <laughs> Uh, I went back the following year to try to get more shots of the area. It had completely changed. The water level was lower. It was drier. I think it was during a drought year. But the blossoms weren't there. So you know, these landscapes are constantly changing. Um, don't. So when you're there, you have to take advantage of it. Yes, you do. And you also have to learn how to adjust when things aren't what you expect. Sure. Um, I've made the mistake, or I used to, going back to a spot expecting to take a similar photo to what I had gotten before and doing a better job of it. And then you get there and it's an entirely different scene. It's like, okay, well now I got to adjust the way I'm seeing this whole thing and I'm going to have to do something different. So landscape is always changing. Um, here's a, the, the uh, color version of that black and white I showed you earlier. This is in the Great Swamp. I, I like the black and white version. Yeah, so do the, I. the color version is very nice. The color version is nice. Thank black you. Black. Um, but yes, I, I like the black and white better. It's just it's totally different. But it seems there's a lot more going on in it that you can notice. Uh, this is in the Highlands again. Headwaters of the Delaware. This is along um, Old Mine Road, Delaware Water Gap. Getting more flowers here. This is out in Somerset County, I believe. This is another hunted and land trust preserve along the Delaware. Um, it almost reminded of sycamores, which we have a lot of in New Jersey. And it was really beautiful, that, that white bark. Uh, it almost reminded me of the aspens out west. I think that's why I shot these. Um, and that's more yellow than I'm looking at on the computer screen. Should be more orange, should be darker. This is uh, Highlands again, New Jersey Highlands. Here's the Raritan River, Ken Lockwood Gorge. And again, certain elements here are working with each other. Curves in the branches here are kind of framing in the photo, but they're also uh, kind of reflecting and repeating the curves established down here, even the curve in the top of the rock. Even the, this patch of color of colors here are kind of on a diagonal. So you have this rhythm that's established here throughout the photo, and it's offset by these horizontals and then by the kind of a stage down below. So again, you know, compositionally, that's, that's what I'm looking at. All, every element has equal importance. Um, I, I see your big lens back there, I'm thinking wildlife photography is an entirely different approach, and one that I don't quite have the patience for. I've tried. <laughs> I'm saying, where's the birds? Because yes, exactly. And I've tried. I have a 500 millimeter lens, it's a slow lens, but it's I used it uh, for the Nature Conservancy back in the 90s. Uh, and I got a couple shots of uh, oyster catchers and a couple sandpipers, egrets, that sort of thing. Nothing like what I'm sure you get. Um, but again, it's an entirely different approach. But I think a successful wildlife photographer is one who can incorporate both compositional right. elements and the use of the background with grabbing that right. subject and freezing it in midair. Um, and I'm sure you, you have experience with that. Um, this is old, the old days, 1980s uh, Kodachrome. But this is Alamuchi Mountain, which is right up the road from us. Uh, mountain biking through there, came across this meadow. I had never really explored the park. Um, I was just I didn't have my uh, camera for very long, just experimenting with my, my Pentac, my 645, uh, and came across this beautiful scene. And, and it almost at the time I felt like I was on the African savanna. Uh, Sunset Lovers Run. This is part of a almost 4,000 acres that uh, landowner in uh, Andover Byron Township area near Lake Apatcon. He's um, preserved the entire parcel or a bunch of different parcels, but preserved most of the land, which is good news. 
It was an interesting um, lesson that other one in the phenomenon of when the sky is always lighter than the reflection in the water. Uh, this one. Yes, it's an example yes. of when the, the water is always darker than the sky. Right. It's like the reflection. And so how do you decide what to expose for? You know, yeah. you want like enough detail in the sky, the color, saturate the colors. Right. But you don't, you know, so you would underexpose it a little bit, but you don't want to you don't lose want to lose the reflections in the, in the bottom. Exactly. So it's and a choice. It is a choice. And you um, don't want to be neither here nor there. Right, right. Um, it's a struggle, and I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, yes, this is obviously much darker, but the human eye sees more of this. Um, in this case, I don't think I did too much. I may have brightened this up just a little bit, but again, my goal is to keep it real and as accurate as possible. So I don't, I don't want to go crazy, and my priority is not to have anything blown out. Right. This looks out of gamut. It's not. Um, the original, you can see details in these yellow streaks. That is the choice photographers often make. It's just to expose for the highlights and let the shadows fall where they may. Exactly, exactly. Um, and that's my priority. I, I don't like anything blown out. I don't like anything overexposed. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it, it really hurts sometimes to lose that detail in the shadow. Because when I was there, I could see you know trees on the opposite shore. I could see more of the sunset down below. Um, but again, I don't want to go in and alter too much. And if you do go too far with it, it starts to look a little weird. And, uh, it doesn't look real. Yeah, exactly. So right. keeping it real. Right, just one more minute. Okay, all right. Is, it your, is anyone else coming in? No, this is the end. So okay. okay. Do you want to do a Q&A or anything? Okay, good. I'm going to zip through these. I got a bunch of water shots for you. This is up in Maine, Baxter State Park. This is along the Raritan. Um, the thing I struggled with here is these leaves kept going by, kept flowing by with the water, and I had to, I took a bunch of exposures, and there was a leaf over here, there was one stuck on a rock, and I had to wait for it. I couldn't walk out there because the water was deeper between me and this graphic. Um, so I, I, I was tempted to you know, take my shoes off and just jump in, which I've done in the past, um, and just to grab the leaf. But you know, again, I, I don't want to alter the landscape either. That's, a, that's the other rule that I try not to break. Um, so real, that was a struggle, but I'm, I'm very happy with this. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's it. It's another one that wouldn't be the same as black and white. No, that would be entirely different. Because the blue and yellow are complementary colors. They both come up about the same tone of red. Exactly. And then you wouldn't have any. That, any you wouldn't have any yet. difference. So. Uh, great. Thanks. Um, this is Mayo Dickerson Reservation. Uh, this is the Delaware Road again. I know people, this has been done a thousand times, but I still like it. Um, here's an instance where it's a long exposure and I, and I don't like this effect. Uh, it, it's, it's appealing to the eye. A lot of people do this. A lot of, you'll see horizons. You'll see where people have panned a scene on the beach with the ocean and the sky and they get just everything's kind of blurry or they held that camera out the window which is cool, and, and it, it is a soothing effect. It feels good, it's, it's nice to look at. Um, but again, it's not what the human eye saw. So I do have a little bit of a struggle with this, with this image. Um, here, it's obvious that it's not what the human eye is seeing. So I don't feel as if I'm being as dishonest as if, um, as if I cloned something or whatever. Uh, this is Flatbrook uh, near uh, Walpack Valley, uh, Delaware Water Gap. This is Watchung Reservation, another 2,000 acre preserve in the suburbs. Just really beautiful spot. Here are a few shots of the Passaic River. And I find myself drawn to these little details. And I have a whole bunch. I'm going to zip through them. Feel free to stop me. Um, how are they looking on the screen? No, yeah, that's close. Again, should be a little darker. Those blues should be more pronounced. Um, this was, um, uh, what's the name of the reservoir? Not, not, uh, I can't remember, it's in the Highlands. What is it? Um, it'll come to me. But a reservoir in the, in the Highlands, 
Um, and it was a stormy, not a stormy day, but one of those days where the big white fluffy clouds were blowing by, brilliant blue sky. The undersides of the clouds were gray. So this is more gray. It doesn't look that blue in the original. Um, so I'm getting all that. And then the sun is hitting the, the opposite shore. And, and it's in early spring, or not early spring, but probably May or June. Um, so the leaves are really green at that point. We have a bunch here. I did a whole series of these. Um, this one's a cloud. This one just, I love the silvery effect. And I'm watching it. It was a breezy day. And the, the area that I'm shooting is maybe 15 feet in front of me. Uh, and I'm just sitting there waiting. And every now and then a breeze would come and the ripples would do something else. Um, so it was, it was fun to just uh, wait for the magic to happen. And uh, each shot was completely different. And I hardly moved from where I was. This is all happening right in front of me. Of the clouds and the blue sky. Yeah, it works beautifully. Yeah. Um, similar, more gray clouds in this. This is a different day. A few here, and then what I did was I started to zoom in closer. Um, so these are a lot of fun. I haven't sold too many. I've sold a few. Um, but it's just interesting the different effects you get. And then here, just an oak leaf and some still water. That is it. Thank you. And you're very welcome. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, your, new, your new camera that you're using, like you said, the Sony. Yep. And you used to use that medium format. Yes, I had a uh, Pentax 645. Now, with the quality of the pictures, yeah, from the medium format to the new Sony, um, I'm happier with the new Sony. Okay. Uh, the medium format, great. I had a six by seven also. Yeah. So that's so one of them. One of them's like two thirds of a Hasselblad, you know, a square. Yeah. The other one's like an extra third, or so an extra quarter. Um, so a nice big slide that I would print from. Um, and then I, later on, I'd scan and, and print digitally. Um, but no, I find with a digital sensor, uh, I can go a lot bigger depending on what software I'm using. This was shot with a drone. And the camera, the lens on the drone is tiny. The sensor is tiny. It would be comparable to my old phone. Um, well, I'm on that topic. So that's a drone camera, whatever they are. That is a drone, yeah. And they're, they're pretty good, you know, just like the, all the phones these days. And you get a lot of detail yeah, from these tiny it. sensors. You can see it. Yeah. Um, and then you can use a, a software which will interpolate and enable me to enlarge it. For this, I used uh, Gigapixel, um, which you can take a tiny JPEG and you can blow it up pretty big and retain that detail. And it is interpolating it, but it's still very accurate. It, you know, it, 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 that's pretty much what I did here. So you did that in like in, 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 on a computer. Yes, and it's a digital image to begin with. Um, but just to experiment, my, my intention is to have these uh, big 40 inch prints right. uh, of these tree shots. Detail. And have, have to retain the detail. Um, and I did go in and I, just to make sure before I introduced the series and decided that I didn't need to buy a new drone, which I'm, I'd like to get anyway, but um, just to make sure I could do it, pull it off. So I did enlarge one of these um, using Gigapixel. I enlarged it using the new Photoshop uh, image size feature, image size 3.0 or whatever it's called. Um, whatever it's called. Um, so Gigapixel is it like a part of Photoshop? Or uh, it can like either be a plug-in or it can be used separately. Um, but keep an eye, it's the company's Topaz. It's Gigapixel AI. Um, and then it has Gigapixel Sharpen, Gigapixel Sharpen AI, something like that. So it has a sharpening uh, software also. Is it like noise reduction and sharpening? And that kind of uh, yes, so they have, an, they have another one, step, a third one that uh, reduces noise. Um, okay. So and it's incredible that 
you know, I was able to do this and, it, and it, it's still realistic. It's not adding stuff that not, wasn't necessarily not there. It, it's adding, it's enhancing what was there. No, you're right. So I am, I am cheating a little. Great. Thank you. Yeah. But, but, this, but the pixel quality. And the Thank course, you for coming. And the course is not the only uh, uh, are not the only thing to consider um, when you're talking about the large format film and versus digital. No, there is like tonal uh, gradations between uh, colors and tones. You exactly. know, like and and so you're you know the, the large format film has beautiful transitions between. Tones, but what? How does that relate to the tiny sensor? Um, you do lose some of that, um, some of those gradations um, aren't quite as smooth. But it, it is getting better. Again, this is a, a a drone with a tiny camera, a tiny sensor. If I were to upgrade, and I do plan to upgrade, and I'm watching the technology, I'm waiting for the right drone to come out. Um, but as the sensors get bigger and as they get better, those gradations will be a little more. Um, well, in this kind of thing where it's so busy, it's not as apparent that the tonal no. transitions are not as smooth. Like something like this, you would definitely be able to see. Exactly. Like between the dark blue of the sky and, right. and the lighter horizon. Exactly. And here it's not as dependent on that. Right. You're right. Um, just, well, just so you I guys think where you put that is you put it on the ceiling of the Smithsonian. Ah, <laughs> that, that belongs on a ceiling. That's great. That belongs on a real big ceiling. That's right. I love that. Like flying on the sky, yeah. you know, looking down, looking up. The they should put, so weird. They put that on the ceiling. That's so weird. They put they put yoga mats up. <laughs> um, or show it in a planetarium. There you go. You have to find a place with a big ceiling. Um, I have to introduce Donna Compton, uh, is a volunteer for the New Jersey Highlands Coalition and an accomplished and very talented photographer. Um, uh, and she has made the our Highlands art exhibit what it is today. Um, so I, I just I have to introduce you. So thank you. Um, and thank you for your help today. Um, back to photo quality and phones and all that. This was taken with an iPhone 5 in Photoshop. Um, and you can see the detail in this. Wow. And this is old. This is an old camera and an old version of Photoshop. Um, but to be able to retain that kind of detail with a tiny lens and a tiny sensor, um, to me, is, I think that's amazing. And this is where the technology will continue to progress. And as I mentioned before, you can no, it's, a great shot. it's a great beautiful. shot, especially Thank when you cut that. The lighter yeah. part is so beautiful. There's a little bug on there, too. The iPhone 5 was right when um, Apple like said this is like the future, and they they printed billboards. Yes, in from, Times Square. From from I remember the, that. Yes, and this, they were incredible. And yeah, they were incredible. Yeah. It was really unbelievable, actually. Yes, <laughs> and it'll continue to progress. Just to do. Thank you. Thanks very much.